welcome. You're listening to the Clock and Talk, an Arsenal podcast. I'm your host, Tez. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. You'll follow us at Clock and underscore Talk on Twitter. Each and every week, I um, be calling this bloke all the names under the sun when I introduce him, and I'm thinking, fucking hell, what can I call him? But I'm going to promote him because he's been with me since day one to co-host. Tony, how are you, mate? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I mean, I'm, I've actually made more appearances than you, just putting it out there. Um, <laughs> but I have absolutely zero hosting skills, as attested to by every time you're here, someone else hosts it. But yeah, I, I'm all good. I'm chilling in Spain, um, doing absolutely nothing, which is quite similar to what I do in England, but a bit hotter. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and there's another bloke who's been missing for the last couple of weeks, but he's like a solar eclipse. When he does turn up, he's a beautiful thing. How are you, Schwinn? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, I did not expect that introduction. I'm, I'm doing very well. Glad to be back. It's been It's been a rough couple of weeks since I, I was moving away from, from the United States, but now I'm all settled and, and ready to talk Arsenal. So where have you been for the last two weeks? Because the listeners want to know. And, and mate, the... the, the um, the DMs have been coming in and asking where Schwinn and, you know, all the Sheilas have been asking yeah, where Schwinn. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, why not, why not? <laughs> uh, for fuck's sake. Uh, breaking news to you girls, he'd scare a dog out of a butcher shop just quietly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was around. I was just taking care of some, some responsibilities before I left the U.S. There was a lot that came with it. Uh, visas and you know closing down accounts. Uh, it, it wasn't pretty, but saying goodbye to some friends and who I was hosting when when you boys were recording, so I missed out on that one. But of course, I caught up with the shitstorm that was caused on Twitter. And shitstorm, uh, what shitstorm? Was there a shitstorm? Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure you've already deleted that from your memory, haven't you? I can't remember, mate. I can't remember what I did yesterday, let alone two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you what you did yesterday. Shout out to Bundaberg Rum. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get them on board for a sponsor shortly. <laughs> um, well, Tony, we were completely wrong, mate, because well, I thought he was detained in the Mexican border. So anyway, completely fucked that up. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't kept in a cage, thankfully. <laughs> let's uh, let's just touch quickly on Schwinn with his World Cup because he he's had more teams than. Fucking, we can all poke a stick at. He's had Colombia, Mexico, bloody Germany, France. I can't keep up. Um, your final take on the World Cup, Schwinn? Uh It was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed it, despite uh, my team, my only team. I don't know where you got Mexico and <laughs> France out of that. I, I never once mentioned any allegiance to either of those countries, but... Uh, despite Germany bowing out early, uh, you know, I had enough time to come to terms with it and then enjoy the rest of the cup. I was seriously hoping for Brazil and Belgium not to win it. And I'm glad that was obviously not the case uh, eventually. It was it was very unpredictable. And I'm sure you boys talked about this uh, in, during the last couple of weeks. You know, going into a game, you really couldn't pick a winner. You could pick a favorite, perhaps, but... Uh, I think most of the bookies and you know wherever you saw odds, it was it was quite uh, quite tough to pick a winner going into the game. So I thought it was one of the last of its kind, considering the next one is going to be in the winter and the one after that is going to have more nations. So I thought Russia did a very good job of hosting, uh, and uh, you know I've not seen any reports of any violence or of any hooliganism, which is which is good to hear, which was obviously a fear coming into the tournament. So lots of lots of uh, fans were happy. Lots of fans traveled, particularly from South America, which was nice nice to see, and just just a wonderful atmosphere. Good temperatures at times. It got hot, but from from what it seemed, uh, the fans really enjoyed themselves. And uh, you know, shout out to Croatia for for going pretty much all the distance and you know not leaving, not taking any prisoners. They did really well. It was a it was a tr- treat to watch them and watch them as a team and I really enjoyed uh, Luka Modric and Ivan Rakitic in, in midfield. I just hope they had won it, but France were deserved winners and you know, the less said the better about that. Did you um, mull over the uh, predictions that we did at the start? How did any of us go? Because I don't, I don't think me and Tony could really remember what we picked. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember you had said on the pod that Uruguay was a dark horse, uh, which I, which was not the case. It was 
uh, Russia, which obviously did very well. Uh, you know, we don't need to get into why. I think most of us know how that happened. But uh, they impressed, of course, knocked out Spain at some point. And to be fair to Uruguay, I, I think they were also very good. We obviously got to see Lucas Torreira. And the game against Portugal was was very impressive. So the the World Cup predictions obviously went out the window, depending on how we, you know, came up with our brackets. Because many many good teams, or that you'd consider on paper good teams, didn't make it through. But in terms of uh, top goal scorers and and the like, you know, we we didn't really uh, hit the nail on the head there either. So you know, we obviously don't know what we're talking about here, do we? <laughs> Not at all, mate. We just we just come here every week and. We're all right. I think we go all right talking Arsenal, but when it comes World Cup, we are completely out of our depth. Tony dribbles on like he thinks he knows what he's talking about, but I have my doubts. Um, how are you, Tony? <laughs> okay, let's get into some Arsenal news. Um, Tony, we have a couple of... There's a bit of news going around about Welbeck may be on the outer. I'm reading here Newcastle United. Yeah, I mean, I've read one or two reports. I mean, first thing is I don't imagine he's in the country. I imagine he's on holiday, but obviously his representatives could sort all that out. But I've also read reports of a loan, and as far as I'm aware, he's got a year left on his contract. So a loan would suit nobody, really. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't see that. I wouldn't be surprised if he if he's gone, but I, I think reports at this time are probably journalists thinking they wouldn't be surprised if he's gone, so they've linked him with something, but there's probably not too much substance to it. Yeah, I'm also saying Lazio, Lazio as well. Lazio, so. That's, yeah, more Iwobi. Yeah. They've been linked with oh, Iwobi, Iwobi yeah, sorry, yeah, Iwobi, yeah. Um, Welbeck, you'd like to keep hold of him this season? Um, he said, look, I think at the moment he offers us something that none of our other players do um, or in, in similar positions. Uh, I, I get he's frustrating and he, he does have many bad qualities, but he does have some good ones as well. Again, I put a poll out the other day um, and I knew what the answer to this would be. I said, who would you prefer to keep, Welbeck or, or Lucas Perez? And Lucas Perez got about 70%. Uh, and I knew that would be the case, but personally, I'd prefer Welbeck. Mm, OK. What about you, Schwinn? What would what do you vote? Uh, I voted for Perez. You know, I, I agree with Tony. I think there's there's a certain dynamic that that Welbeck provides, and ideally, Welbeck would have had two years remaining on his contract, so that you know we don't ha- we don't have to worry about him this summer, and probably shipped him off next summer. But that's obviously not the case. And if he's not to extend, then of course, just like Aaron Ramsey, I like to get rid of him this summer and and protect our our investment. Uh, when you look at both of them in terms of footballing ability, I think both have certain traits that are that are very different to each other. Well, Beck's this sort of guy who's going to run and harass you and and you know run till till the very end, till the time he drops to the floor. Well, whereas Lucas is a bit more technical, decent on the ball, good at linking up play, and can obviously play a couple of different positions. From what little I saw of Lucas, from what little we've seen of Lucas in an Arsenal shirt, uh, he impressed me and. I, I never quite understood why Arson never gave him more of a chance. Age isn't on his side, uh, which Welbeck does have on his side. But my only problem with Danny Welbeck is that even if we get him a new contract that he's willing to sign for a decent wage and for basically a position on the bench to provide depth, I don't think he's, you know, he's he's not at the level that we need for the, for our club. And an extension right now means that there's no way we. Prop. We're going to be able to ship him in the next two or three years. Um, and that's not something I, I want to get on board with. I would rather get rid of him right now for 10, maybe 15 million if you can get that uh, for him and and put our eggs in a different basket or in, in, into a new winger next summer. So my vote would be for Perez, but I can see arguments for, for Welbeck. That makes sense to me as well. Okay. And Awobi? Uh, it will be a more interesting one. You know, I, I've been having some conversations with people on Twitter about it, and I have I don't understand why people want to sell Iwobi. I, I just don't get it. Look, he's an academy product. He costed us pretty much nothing except playing time at the sake of someone else. And we have nothing to gain from his, you know, we have nothing to lose from his failure. And we have a lot to gain from his success. You know, if, if we sell him right now and he goes on to become a superstar, we'd look like mugs. 
I'd rather give him two years, just like I'd rather give Emery two years and see how he progresses under Emery. And, you know, at that point, he'll be 23, 24. We can see what a new manager has been able to do to him, change him, improve him and, and see how it goes. You know, he's happy to be a squad member. He doesn't earn a lot of wage compared to what we'd have to pay a replacement. And he's shown sparks. If he can somehow be more consistent with those those performances. And that's pretty much our argument for all Arsenal players at times. Consistency. That's what we need out of Iwobi. If your argument is that he's not good enough, I understand that. But if your argument is consistency, then that should be an argument for the whole squad. And at that point, you know, you're blurring the lines. So for me, I definitely keep hold of Iwobi and see how he does over the next two years. Tony, there's a couple of more names that we're linked to. Um, Kingsley Coman. Yeah, um, don't know where he's come from. I, I don't know if the press believe, like most of us, that we need a winger and want a winger, and we want someone quick. So, and they've looked at, I mean, obviously the strongest link, or not the strongest link, the one that seems to be going around the most is Dembele. And maybe the press have thought, well, they, they want a winger from a top-tier club, but they're, they're going to have to get one that, that maybe doesn't start every week. And that's why Coman's come into to that equation I don't know maybe we have made made contact but I, I just feel like it seems to have come out come out of nowhere um, he's the type of player that we need um, he's obviously young he's been at some very big clubs PSG Juventus Bayern Munich um, I don't know if he's worth the, the, the 45 46 million that's being quoted um, but we'll see um, I, I would be surprised if we signed him anyway but it, it does suit. It would suit a need that we have. Mm-hmm. And one other there is uh, Gomez from Barcelona. Yeah, that kind of seems to have come and gone away. A few Spanish papers were going very big on it that it was sort of basically done. Um, there's, there's that key word again, done. Uh, yep. The other day, sometime last week. But Spanish papers are weird because they they all seem to like here the papers are oh, in England. Sorry, the papers are somewhat neutral. Um, they they have a bit of agenda, but they'll report news for everyone. Whereas in Spain, it's a bit like Real Madrid basically run one paper, Barcelona run another, and they just use it to get their own propaganda out. It's mm-hmm. it's, it's it's a bit weird to watch. Um, so I, it's very hard to believe the the Spanish press. Actually, no, I'm going to throw another name at you. Um, Summer, Summer, Jan Summer, Jan Summer. Um, yeah, Jan Sommer. Again, I don't know where it came from. It seems it came completely out of nowhere. It would mean selling Czech and Ospina, which I, I wouldn't be too adverse to. But it seems as though I don't think either of the two keepers, as in Sommer and um, and Leno, would would want to be second choice. Mm. So it would be it would be a weird one. Um, so again, I can't see it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um... Now, just quickly on a couple of outs, you know, there's a few rumours floating around with Staffy. You think it's going to happen before the end of the window? And if it does, would we have to bring in another centre back? Uh, I, I can't see it happening, but if it does, then yeah, we would have to replace, uh, I would imagine. What, what's difficult at the moment is the, the merry go round of, in pretty much every position, just the, the whole transfer merry go round hasn't sort of kicked into action yet. And as soon as one domino falls, so to speak, they'll all follow suit. But at the moment, nothing's happening to, to kickstart everything else. Mm. So at the moment, like with Arsenal centre-backs or with Arsenal in general, everything looks quiet. And it could just be one thing happens that, for example, William goes to Barcelona and then that leads to something else and that leads to something else. It leads to Juventus finally selling someone because now someone else has got more money. For example, um if William goes, then Chelsea have now got money, so they might go and buy someone from Juventus to help balance their books, who then might have some profit left over to try and buy Mustafi. I'm, I'm making up examples here. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, this yeah, is going to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah. But that this whole, the whole football, everyone's looking at a merry-go-round in terms of wingers or attacking players, and obviously people are saying, oh, Dembele, it need, this needs to happen, that needs to happen. But I just think on all transfers, there's been no big catalyst yet, and and once it happens, everything, like all the moves around it, will start happening. Yeah, yeah. If if um, William goes to Barcelona, does that? In, and I know, look, we're, we're not in the nose by any team or, or by any sign or whatnot, especially with Barcelona. But 
uh, as a fan and as a as a somebody who sits and watches football, do you do you think Barcelona will go? Oh, we got to get rid of Dembele. I don't know because if you look at Coutinho as, a, as an Iniesta replacement, I know they overlap by six months, but if you look at it like that, then then yes, but. And if you think, because like, everyone knows they tried to get Griezmann, was mm. Griezmann going to come in and then Dembele out? And then because they couldn't get Griezmann, they've, they've gone for William uh, and they see him as a similar sort of mould. Or I don't know, but th- I mean, the difference is William can only really play wide the same as Dembele, whereas Griezmann can play as a 10 or, or sort of more central or even a 9 at a push. Yep. Um, so a William coming in would look more like Dembele would have to look elsewhere for playing time. Um, as you said, I don't know, but just just looking at it, you think they're going to play Messi behind Suarez, and if they do play a wide man, and they've just paid seventy odd million or sixty one million, I think it's for William, then one of them two's not going to get a look in. Okay, and Dembele, I'd imagine, be it some type of loan thing. They wouldn't uh, sell him. You don't know. It depends who comes in for him. Look, if they've, if if Chelsea sell William and Hazard, I'm not saying they will. I don't know. But they're going to be very cash rich. Not that they're not anyway, but they're going to be profit cash rich. Mm. So if they are looking at someone like a Dembele, then it would be a sale. If someone like us comes in for him, then I would imagine it would be loan with an option or maybe a loan without an option. Um, if PSG come in for him, they're going to expect, uh, because there's again, there's reports of, of um, sorry Cavani going, which means there's an attacking spot at PSG. If that happens, then, then they would expect PSG to pay for him or... Or do what PSG do best, which is a loan with a with an obligation to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it all depends. Every it's like I said to you last week. I think all transfers in football now, it, not only in terms of value, but they all depend on who the who the person who the the person the club sorry uh, are, because you can set one rules to oh well it's like Premier League. We always say oh, there's a Premier League uh, premium. That when you're in the Premier League, you have to pay more for a player than a team from outside the the Premier League because they think we have more money. And I think with every transfer, it's like that now. It's very rare you get a player, they just go, uh, unless there's a release clause. But without a release clause, it's very rare you get a player and they say, oh, his price is 30 million and it's the same price for everyone. That just doesn't seem to happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Any others others that you think that would, you know, that we've got a clear bit bit of of the books? Uh, Anyone else you think you'd go? Um, no. No uh, loans? Um, from us. Yeah, like from, from us, Ars- sorry, from Arsenal. I mean, I, I mentioned this a long time ago on, on the podcast, and I heard, I think it was in, whenever Rob Holden signed this contract, I heard a rumour that we was um, negotiating a new contract with Iwobi then with a view to loaning him out. Uh, so secure him long term, what Chelsea do. And I remember actually using the same analogy that it's what Chelsea do. They secure him long term and then loan, loan, loan him out. Mm. Um, I heard that, as I said, I think it was back in April uh, about it will be. The report started very strongly again yesterday that, that he's just about to sign a new contract. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do that, get him first team experience. But I would expect it to be a Premier League loan if, if that is what happens. OK. And so Lucas Perez, we more than likely going to keep him this season. Well, I think one of him or Welbeck will go. Okay. Chambers, he'll he'll probably stay. Uh, at the moment, because oh. just because of numbers. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, uh, what's your take on it, Oshwin? You you like a few to stay or go? I mean, there's there's a lot there, and of course, it's it's really hard to tell because we don't know this manager. We don't know how he thinks. We don't know what he's been telling the people upstairs. Uh, frankly, I don't really care uh, who comes in, who goes out. All I care about is once the football starts, what do we do and how we perform? Uh, the, the football is going to be a reflection of the decision-making over the summer. And if we have a few extra players on the bench that, that don't factor in and we go on to have a good season, you know, it's, it's money wasted, so be it. But if we, if we bite the bullet and we get rid of a few players and, and then we don't have enough depth uh, you know, during the season, then then that's again uh, bad decision making. So I don't really pay a lot of attention to the rumors. I obviously speak with you guys and some other people that that are usually talking Arsenal transfers, and I'm happy to dabble, but I don't pay a lot of attention towards them. Uh, all I'm rubbing my hands for are uh, is the start of the season. I'm very excited. It's been a couple of weeks almost since the World Cup has ended, uh, or a week actually. 
and uh, I am just I'm just missing some competitive football, and that's all I really care about at the moment. Yep, I don't really care too much either. I only just threw that question to you, so I can do you some questions, so we can rattle through some questions, boys. A nice bloke, aren't I? Um, <laughs> there's really not much Arsenal related stuff to really go through you know um, we could dribble on here all day about transfers and incomings and outgoings and stuff I, I think you know obviously his uh, right midfield is obviously right winger is what we really do need but we'll, we'll see what happens I think a couple have got to go out before that happens jeez uh, I'd love a Dembele too but then as Moon Tony said last week, he's very raw. So, uh, okay, on some questions, Tony. Uh, I just wanted to. I thought we were going to get Schwinn's take on um, on his beloved Germany and uh, our mercurial number ten. Oh yeah, go through it, Schwinn. Right. I mean, I'm sure uh, most Arsenal fans have seen this at this point that Mesut Ozil has decided uh, to to leave the national team and. Uh, he, of course, put out a comprehensive tweet uh, or tweets, I should say, uh, yesterday where he, you know, let it all out. It it probably was a huge burden on him to start with. I mean, the, the words in there, of course, was probably an ex- it was a PR exercise with his team and were carefully chosen. But but you can get you can get an, a sense of how much this has been bothering him in a nutshell, if you haven't. Uh, it's to do with the right wing in Germany that has defamed him and and has basically called him all sorts of names for for not being of 100% German ancestry. Uh, Mesut Ozil grew up, was born and grew up in Gelsenkirchen, but uh, he has Turkish ancestry because of his uh, because of his family, and he has always noted how close he is to his Turkish roots and how it was always told to him by his family that. You, you should never forget where you're from. Look, Germany did not perform well at the World Cup, and Mesut Ozil probably was one of the reasons why they didn't. I'm not saying that he's the only reason, but there's there's a, there's many reasons why why they didn't perform well. And it just so happens that the German media, or at least some of the German media, have targeted him for for this downfall. Now, I've always. I've always said that he's a bit too close to my heart. So I'll throw this question back at you guys for the for the moment and ask what you guys thought of it since you were, you know, probably a bit further away from this than I was. How much of the blame would you want to put on on Mesut Ozil for for Germany's uh, failings during during the summer? I, I don't I I wouldn't put much on it at all, at all to be honest. I I seen that um did I he created the most chances ever the World Cup? Did I see that run around somewhere? Um, uh, pardon, 90 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So that was. I'm just trying to think where I saw it, but yeah. So I no, I don't think it's. I put a, put the blame on on Ozil for Germany's misfortune. Tony. Yeah, no, I mean not at all on the pitch. I think it, it's being used as a scapegoat because of the the, the picture with the with the Turkish for a uh, prime minister or president, prime minister, I think. Um, what. I mean, what I wanted to ask Schwinn, and obviously Tez, feel free to answer, is two things. Um, firstly, he, he didn't retire from international football. Do you think there's any way back for him, Schwinn, or do you think that's it, he's done with Germany? Uh, it was a president, uh, to your to your earlier point, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey, but I, I think he's done. I think it's, it, it's, it's a blow that cannot be repaired. I think it's, it's the relationship has, has completely been destroyed uh, he spoke about some of the sponsors, some key sponsors. He didn't name names, but you know, I, I don't give a fuck. So of course, he he was alluding to Mercedes Benz, and you know, it was almost talking about the structure in place. You know, he didn't want to say that this is ingrained in the system, but that's sort of what he spoke about in a way. And I do not think he'll be coming back. Uh, I don't even think he'll probably ever live in Germany again. I think he's. Uh, of course, I don't know the guy, so you know this is all speculation. But I think he's so soured by the way things that were handled and uh, or mishandled, I should say, that uh, I don't see a future for him in Germany, let alone in German colors. Well, I felt with his statement that he left the gate open a little bit. I felt that the way he, he said it, that um, I, I, and I'm, I haven't got it in front of me, so I can't exactly quote it, but it was something along the lines as 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 what you know. And until this is fixed, um, then I will be stop stepping aside. So 
I felt that the, the, the gate was just a little bit ajar, that he didn't, you know, come out and say, I'm retiring, I'm done. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I heard rumours that they're already looking into the president of the is it DFB, the German FA, so that that's why I, I asked that question. Look at me taking on the hosting duties, what a guy. Um, <laughs> secondly, do you think he will... And this is my, my main concern, because I don't really care if he's retired from international football or not. Uh, do you think he'll now be playing for Arsenal with a clear mind? Or do you think this this will weigh even heavier on him that he's decided to make this uh, decision and there'll be even more scrutiny on him um, And now? Or do you think he'll be completely free knowing that he doesn't have the worries and the pressures of, of international football anymore? I don't think it was ever the pressure of international football. I think it was the pressure that came with international football in, in a sense, the the media, the the constant jibber jabber, the constant punches that, you know, that were being uh, almost dealt to him on a daily basis. I think this is going to be a big burden off his shoulder. You know, you need to be happy to perform in any job and football is at the end of the day, just another job. I think this is going to clear his head a whole lot. It's going to take international breaks away from him where he can just rest and relax and not worry about traveling with the squad and and, and fatigue and whatnot. Uh, I think we are going to see a more motivated Methodozo. And I'm not speaking in terms of, you know, making more sprints or, 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 or in physical shape, but just a happier Methodozo. You know, we in the last day we've seen some shots of him uh, that that have come through on, on the Arsenal account. And, uh, you know, he's got a smile on his face. He's in, he seems to be enjoying his time in Singapore training. And I think this is, in a way, a trailer for what we can expect. I think he's going to be a much more relieved person. He obviously enjoys the city of London. He feels at home there. And I don't think for any reason that he's going to either regret this because I don't see it getting better in Germany or, or any other place in the, in the short term. And I don't see him finding a reason to go back. And for that reason, uh, I am very confident that he will continue to be happy. Keep, keep, in, mo- keep in mind, though, that he, this all happened prior to the World Cup. So he went, he went with this into the World Cup. Now, how his headspace was, and it, it wasn't a, a big media beat-up um, at the time, but there was a lot of lefties, I don't know, the parties and whatnot over there in Germany, that were really hammering him over it and, and saying that his alliances don't really, you know, rest with Germany and and, and you're this and that. So I wonder what his headspace was like actually going into the World Cup. Look, with that headspace, he was able to conjure up, you know, some really good good football, you know, in, in, in statistically, of course. You know, we all know they struggled, but... We also know that Mats Hummels missed a couple of open headers from point blank range that Mesut will put on a platter for him. Uh, keep in mind the, the the backlash after the photograph was quite huge. Uh, you know, you may not have felt it on on Arsenal Twitter, but if you follow a few German outlets, then you would have seen that it was nasty and it was it was barbaric in a lot of ways. Uh, and he was front and center to all of that. So, I think he did a very good job of just leaving that behind him, uh, doing his national team duties and not disappointing his teammates. Uh, he's a team player. We know that, uh, you know, he doesn't try to get the spotlight more often than not. And he's happy to, to pull the strings, uh, in the background. Yeah. But I think, boy, I, uh, I think when, when, it, what I mean to, though, Schwinn is when it come into the world cup, because he played the first game, I think he was left out of the second game. And then he, that's right. Then he came back for the third game. Now, He's your star. Look, he's one of your star players in that team. Um, so I'd be, I'm a bit questionable, on, on, you know, on why or skeptical, I should say, on why was he left out on that second game? Uh, to be honest, I think it was purely tactical. Uh, he did mention in in one of his posts yesterday that uh, Yogi Lowe stepped up to his defense um, before the World Cup when when this whole saga was going on. And there were reports conflicting to this prior to the World Cup. So we all know that now that was all false. Um, if if that were the case, he probably wouldn't have mentioned Yogulo at all in, in, in these statements, I feel. And uh, the fact that he said that, you know, some members of the coaching staff, including Lowe, stepped up for him, uh, I think is indicative of the fact that he had his team's support uh, going into the World Cup. 
look, I'm not denying he didn't have a good World Cup. He obviously did not have a good World Cup. There's no doubt in that. The team did not have a good World Cup. And after the first game, you know, as the manager, you want to try something else. And of course, he was one of the the players that uh, that was taken out. Uh, people will tell you that they went on to win the game despite him being involved or because he was not involved. But let's not forget, it was a late, late free kick and a freakish free kick from from Tony Cruz to to win that game. I, I just think that some of the backlash really took a toll on him because, look, when you're when you've moved to a different country, either as a youngster or you're born in a different country, as you know, uh, to your parents, th- there is a side of the world that that is new to you and that most people do not know. As an immigrant, I can talk about that to an extent because I moved without my family most of the times and it has been a challenge. But when you're constantly in the public eye and you're being and you're being called all these names, goat fucker, and you know, I, I know Tony enjoyed that one, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the backlash gets after a point unnecessary and it, it, it gets overwhelming almost. And that's the reason I say that he's going to be a much happier person because every time he wore that shirt, you know, people said that he performed better. But I thought he always looked scared. You know, he he did the more obvious thing to me. In an Arsenal shirt, you can see him popping up in different places. He's more creative. He's trying different things. And to me, it was always baffling that that people always said that he was better in German colors, which to me he wasn't other than the last World Cup, of course. So I, I think this is going to just free his spirit. I think he's going to put this behind him and, and you know, just concentrate on Arsenal and, and enjoy football in London. And I'm really, really happy for him. He's, he's taken a bold decision, a courageous one, one that basically sets the testament to what a time we live in today. And people should follow suit. You know, we, we've seen some big, big people being toppled in the last year from Hollywood to, to politics everywhere throughout the world, sporting, the sporting world. And this is just another domino to that piece. And I think the youth of today is going to take this as an example and make sure that we do not fail as, as a race in the future to this. I'm, I'm getting a bit more elaborate than I wanted to, but I think it's very indicative of the time we live in. Well, I'm gonna, I'll lighten the mood up a little bit. Um, <laughs> if he's not your favorite player, you can, you know, Granite Shaka, you can have a little pose of him if you want to okay? go. Oh, thank you, Tez. I, I never realized you're going to be sharing Grand Chuckle with someone. I feel of course, honored. Mate. You're a good man. You're a good bloke. Mate. You really <laughs> did miss me th- those two weeks, didn't you? Oh, my. I did. I did. <laughs> Even Granite had a little political dig at the World Cup as well, so you just can't, can't keep our players away from it. <laughs> he did, actually, yeah. That was fucking. I still don't even know what that was, but uh, anyway. Um, Tony, a little question for you from Glenn since we're talking about this subject. Uh, how can the club, Glenn Baxter, how can the club lift Ozil's moral up after recent events in the Germany? He's going to need some support because we need him at his best. Um, I mean, I think it's been quite good to see that the majority of fans on, on social media or on Twitter have got behind him. I know that that's your usual pricks, but e- even most of the people we'd commonly associate with being complete idiots of the Arsenal fan base on Twitter. I'm not going to name any names, so I don't want to start any wars again, but even the majority of them have been on his side and, and tweeting support, which is always good to see. I'm quite surprised Arsenal haven't done a, a statement backing him. Uh, they've done a few low-key things, like they've been they done a photo of the squad training in Singapore and they, they uh, one of the hashtags was Arsenal for everyone and uh, they said something about being inclusive and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so they've been putting in uh, support of him sort of low-key. Uh, I, I thought they would have done a statement. I don't think they will now. I think they just let the moment pass and maybe in a sense trying to play it down because they don't want all the pressure to be on him and the media to look at everything he does in relation to, to his retirement or not from international football. Um, so I think they'll support him, but, but maybe low key. I did see something, uh, I'm not sure, one of our followers I think tweeted it saying... Um, had this been in the Wenger area, there would have been a, a big, long, uh, impassioned defence of him from Wenger. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I can't see Emery doing that, and that's not a positive or a negative. As I said, I think Arsenal are just trying to let it blow over mm. and, and go under the radar um, in a certain certain sense. But I still wouldn't be surprised if Wenger does come out and defend him. Mm-hmm. No, it's good. I hope, I'm glad a lot of the Arsenal... Um, 
fans are getting behind him, and, and that's what we should do because we love our players and we love we as as much as me and Schwinn muck around, we'd say you'd be the piss out of each other, but um, we do love Ozil, so we we got to stick by those players. There was a hashtag going around. I just can't remember their hashtag though, boys. I, I stand with Ozil. I stand with Ozil. So 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 write your messages out and hashtag I stand with Ozil. So each and every week we have a couple of our listeners call us for a live segment. You too can get involved with this at clockend underscore talk and you'll uh, find our Skype details in the bio. This week uh, we have Sandeep. How are you, Sandeep? I'm good, Tez. How are you? I'm oh, good, mate. Good. What's your question, buddy? Um, first of all, uh, where do you think we'll probably... I, I know we've asked this question a few times over the a transfer window, but where do you reckon we might end up finishing, especially looking at uh, how Liverpool is probably strengthened and uh, Chelsea probably might strengthen in the coming weeks? Um, and yeah, just a basic prediction from all you guys as to whether we can get a top four finish this year and how critical it would be because um, other teams, I feel like, might start probably creating a bit of a gap in terms of the top six as well. Okay, Tony? Um, it's a difficult one because I mean obviously I said last week Chelsea is a bit of an enigma because we don't know how Sarri's going to do things he's obviously not had a full pre-season uh, there's rumours about a lot of their best players leaving and coming back late from the World Cup they obviously had Hazard, Courtois and Kante all involved in the last weekend of the World Cup so uh, I mean they're a bit I'm, I'm a bit unsure about them Liverpool have obviously done good business but that doesn't always translate to on the field um, obviously, they've got to, they've got to fit all these players in. I think on the whole, they benefit from having not a lot of players gone deep in the World Cup. Um, Henderson's the only one I can really think of off the top of my head, and to be honest, to be missing him is probably a blessing for them. Um, uh, they may be without Allison for the first week of the season, but I mean, it's, he's obviously a new signing. Um, it's difficult. I don't think. We'll be. I don't think we'll be cut adrift of the top six. I don't think they'll they'll pull away. Um, I, I think it's a real fight for top four. Um, as a, beyond City, I think any one of the four t- uh, five teams can finish in any one of the five positions. Obviously, if I was putting money on it now, I'd probably expect Liverpool to finish in the top four. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't. Obviously, United are under their third season under Mourinho, which is usually always a recipe for disaster. Um, so I don't see any of the other non-top six teams catching up and I don't see any of the, the teams in the top six pulling away from us. But where we finish, I think it could be anywhere from, from second to sixth. So you're not willing to give a give a, a third or fourth or fifth? You, you're going to go second to sixth? No, I think we... Like, I mean, we have to see how the season starts with the, how the transfer window finishes and with there being so many changes. I mean, obviously there's two, us and Chelsea with new managers, Liverpool with not a whole new squad but some very different players Tottenham moving into an essentially a new ground I think the first month of the season will probably tell us quite a lot whereas I would usually say ignore the first month of the season because teams are just getting into their stride but I think with so many changes as I said we don't know what style Chelsea are going to play we don't know what style we're going to play Tottenham are moving ground midway through the season or in September apparently but by all accounts it might be a bit later than that so I think the first month to six weeks is going to be very key this year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Schwinn? Very tough to say. I mean, Tony just said that Chelsea's an enigma, but to me right now, even the Arsenal is an enigma. You know, we've not seen a whole lot of us other than Bournemouth, which of course we can probably discard uh, as a friendly and two closed door friendlies. There's not a whole lot that the team has played together. And uh, a couple of new key signings haven't quite been integrated yet. Lucas Torreira hasn't even joined up with the squad yet. So it's very early, to say the least. But I look at the other squads, and uh, other than City and Liverpool, as, as Tony mentioned, you know, I, I look at Tottenham and Man United, and they haven't strengthened a whole lot either. And Chelsea are playing their first friendly as we record today, and apparently they are they are quite different organism to to what they have been previously so uh, I did want to catch that game and I'm unable to maybe it says you have that on since they're playing in Australia but I, I I'm quietly confident I think there's not a whole lot of changes that have happened around our club 
in terms of the personnel. I think the the signings have been more so to the tune of depth. And under our new manager, I can see the squad really excelling. So I can see us uh, definitely finishing fourth, uh, maybe not, maybe even third, if that's a possibility, uh, depending on how the season opens and how we gain momentum. So I'm quietly confident. What are you, what's your thoughts on it, Sandy? Yeah, um, look, similar to you guys, I'm just probably a bit unknown with Arsenal as to what's going to happen. Chelsea's interesting, you know, as Shreen and Tony said, they might be playing a more expensive and attractive way forward in this season, maybe. And under that, how well the team settles in, how long it might take, there's obviously a bit of speculation about Eden Hazard and whether he's going to stay, or Willian, or they might even be losing the goalkeeper. So... I guess it's, it, it is quite uh, interesting because apart from, I think, Man City or Liverpool, I don't think there's kind of like any clear favourites to finishing in the top four. Um, I did have another question, uh, and I think we've asked this a lot of times before regarding Aaron Ramsey, and I think uh, Tony uh, must have put up a poll this week regarding him and whether uh, he might be... Or whether whether fans prefer him to stay or whether he should be sold if he doesn't sign off on a new contract. So, again, it's going to be interesting to see if we are able to keep hold of someone like Ramsey or it's going to be something that by January we might be losing out on. Uh, so, for those who didn't see, obviously, Sandeep's talking about the poll I put out the other day, which was if he doesn't sign a contract by the start of the season when the transfer window closes... Uh, would you try and sell him shortly before the transfer window closes or would you keep him going into the season and hope he signs with obviously the risk of losing him for free in the summer? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was about 70 percent uh, said they would rather him sold if in that situation. Um, so that, that's where we're at. I, I think it'd be very risky and stupid business to. To sell him, I think you'll sell him, but you, you, you've broke up again, Tony. <laughs> What's your what's your take on it, Schwinn? My take uh, is that Tony's been cursing South African internet, but he should be probably looking into his own backyard in Spain before he starts talking about my internet here. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I have to say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been down this road before, and just last year, you know, uh, I, I do not imagine a scenario where where there's any plus point. Of, of retaining Aaron Ramsey going into the season. It's it's going to be a major distraction. Let's assume for, for a second that we'll be able to sign him on in November, right? From now on till November, it's just going to be this one fruit hanging over us. And it's going to be one of those things that Emery has to counter at every press conference. And it's just going to become this massive talking point. Uh, at that point, the season almost takes a back seat for many people, especially in the media. And how we're performing, how we're being able to gel as a team with or without Aaron, you know, those things come into the microscope a whole lot. And it's just a massive, massive distraction. Uh, for me, he has to be sold if he's not going to uh, extend his contract. And to be fair to Tony, he's been shouting this since last September, you know, ever since we tabled our, our first offer to him. So for for. For that to be an issue for almost a year to this point, I think is is just stupid. We've been down this road and it's naive and I'm not quite sure what's going on. Considering how well we've done throughout the summer, this one just baffles me that we haven't been able to get a solution for this uh, so far. And just, I don't know if Tony's back with us, but just correct me if I'm wrong. I heard an interview during the week that... Um, uh, Manchester United actually, when they do, you know, when they negotiate their contracts, they put a an optional year at the end, so this type of drama doesn't happen. Um, it still can happen. It's just, it just maybe it happens a year later. Um, there's talks that we've signed Lichtsteiner with a year with a year option. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but it, it would still be the same thing. So instead of a contract being four years, it'd be three plus one. So it doesn't make a difference. The contract still got to win at some point. Yeah, okay. Right, I see. And anything else, mate? Uh, that's all. Thanks, guys. Okay, mate. Thanks for joining us, and uh, you're welcome anytime, mate. Thank you. Go to Vish now. How are you, Vish? Good, and you guys? Yeah, good, mate. Good. What's your question, buddy? 
Um, considering all our signings, do you think we are ready for the new season? Um, everybody is yapping on about Liverpool. In my personal opinion, they're a bunch of cunts. <laughs> they spend 900 in 10 years and they still can't win a trophy. But uh, what do you think of Arsenal? Do you think we are ready to mount a, t- a title challenge this year? Just, yeah, and I'll, before I go to Tony, just, just uh, as you said, a lot of people are talking about Liverpool. And just for the simple fact that we're all talking about Liverpool, we're all obviously a little bit worried. So, um, Tony, what's your thoughts on it, mate? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not particularly worried about Liverpool. I mean, they've done eye-catching business because they've spent a lot of money, but um, I, I wouldn't say I'm worried. I mean, they, can't, they came above us last year, so in terms of you can't say, oh, they're going to take our place because we'd welcome that. They can take it. They're probably more used to it. Um, in terms of us ready to mount the title challenge, to be honest, we were so far off last year that I, I don't think this year was ever about mounting a title challenge. Obviously, I, I could be wrong, but... I think this year is all about trying to get back into the top four. And we've got a squad that's very capable. Obviously, we don't know how the manager's going to adapt, how the style's going to work, how some of the players are going to adapt. But I can only say what I see on paper at the moment because we haven't played any meaningful games. And I can say we're capable and, and we're ready. But whether that's going to be a reality, obviously, we'll find out between August and May. Schwinn? I have to agree. I mean, you, you look across and you look at clubs like Tottenham and, and, and Liverpool, even to an extent. You know, you, even Manchester City, when, when, when Klopp came in, when Pochettino came in um, and, and Guardiola, the, the first season is always a challenge. You know, new to the league, different atmosphere, tougher schedule. There's a lot that a new manager in England will have to learn and adapt to uh, apart from their squad to be able to understand the league and, and the pace of the league and everything that comes with it. So to, to assume that we will be mounting a t- title challenge might be a bit unfair. It might happen. I'm not, I'm not saying it won't happen depending on how things go, but to have that assumption and to have that as the standard, I think might be a bit too much for, for the first season. Mm. I think the first two seasons are when you want to start, you know, looking at the progress made, see where we finish uh, this coming season and then how the next one goes. And maybe then we can see some, some positive growth for now i think we need to see the brand of football that's played the the character that's shown how do you react after one nil down how do you react to a late equalizer in the 85th minute you know those are the things that i will be looking at to see how we have changed and how we are reacting to some of these things the adversity even the backroom staff for now hasn't seen a lot of that you know it, it's it's not just the team on the field you have to react as a, as a club and there's a lot that this this new setup has to go through before you can mount a title challenge. It's not just on the field, as I said. I'll go around the table and I'll start with you, Vish. Um, you know, let's, I'm touching I'm touching Woody boys because I don't want to jinx it. Halfway through the season, we're coming in tenth. Vish, do you uh, are you are you are, do you calling for Emery's head or are you saying let's give him time? No, I'd say give him time. I mean, look, we stuck out with Wenger for for 10 years when we were mediocre. So I wouldn't be calling for Emery Z if he were 10th uh, mid-season. Okay. I would say just like Klopp, where he finished 8th, and then they gave him funds and they gave him time to develop that squad to what it is right now, we need to do the same with our manager. We we do. I agree. We do need one more game-changer, somebody who's going to give us a different dimension, and make us a little bit more unpredictable. Um, but right now, I, just like Shun said, I'd like to see how this team gels and how they react to, to adversity. Okay. What about you, Tony? Coming 10th, halfway through the season? Give him time? Um, not necessarily. I think you have to look and see why we're 10th, how things are going. If, if you can see what he's trying to do, if he's trying to implement a project and, and it's not, not uh, gelled yet, but you can see where it's going... But mm. if he just looks clueless, then it's a different story. I mean, I know it didn't last long, but look at Conte in the first six weeks at Chelsea. There was talks about sacking him. And suddenly after they lost to us, it, it all clicked and he went on to win the league. The next season won the FA Cup. Um, but had they been a lot more short term and couldn't see the project, he would have been sacked and they never would have won the league. So I think you've got to look at the situation on the pitch and not just put a position and say that's where we are. Mm-hmm. No, good call. Because I was actually thinking like, um, and you know, we've had anger in there for so long um remember when alex ferguson left and Moyes came in it was 
but it was Manchester United. Did he did he last one season, Moyes? No, they had a clause that uh, if you don't make the Champions League, they can get out of the contract. And obviously, it was a lucrative five-year contract. So I think they lost to Everton, which meant they mathematically couldn't make the Champions League anymore. And he got sacked the next mm, day. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, what about you, Schwinn? I want to say that I would like to give him a chance, but halfway through the season, number ten in you know in the table, um, I'll have I'll have a lot of questions. And you know, the, of course, it's a very nuanced situation. You have to see injuries. You have to see what's been going on. Has our priority shifted from you know the the Premier League to the, to the Europa League? And if you're you know switching squads almost as we did towards the tail end of the last season, so there's a lot that will go into it, but. I don't think that's that's going to be acceptable to to Ivan and everyone else, you know, sitting upstairs. I want to be loyal. I want to be supportive, but at the same time, you know, you have to put the club's health uh, first. And coming tenth halfway through the season doesn't really shout promise. So uh, it's, it'll be a tough one. But I'll have to say that I, I won't be asking for Emery's head, but I'll definitely be asking for some accountability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I I think the hardest couple of games is going to be, as Tony said, that first month, um, you know, we've got Manchester City up, straight up, and, and I think we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, would you like them at the end of the season or the start of the season, and, and thinking about their squad, I'd, obviously, I'd like it to play them now, I think it's a perfect time, um, and Chelsea, is that the third game in, I think? Second, um, second, second Chelsea went. Yeah, so I'd like to, you know, City Chelsea. I think it's a perfect time to, to play Chelsea as well. Um, we don't know what Sarri's going to do at Chelsea. I don't even think they know what they're going to do at Chelsea. So I think it's we're we're in a really good position to play them two teams straight off the bat. I think. Um, yeah. Any girls swish, Bish? No, that's it, guys. No, I'm good. no worries, mate. Thanks for joining us, mate. And um, excellent, boys. All right. Cheers. Okay. So, mate, okay, you two can give us a call at any time um, in the live part of the show. You can follow us at clockend underscore talk, and you'll find the link in the bio for our Skype. Okay, you want to do some questions, boys? Okay, go. Okay. Oh, fucking look. Here's, here's Swin's lover boy straight up. Clay Co Conservative, welcome back, Schwinn. You were missed. Oh wow! Although Gimli did a great job filling in. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. What was your G- question? Gimli, Gimli's two for two, by the way, <laughs> yeah. for being on the podcast and and stirring shit up. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for reminding me that. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, uh, we love Gim. He, he's good value, Gim. He'll step in. Uh, he's good the, people. He'll step in during the season when I'm having breaks. So I've got to have holidays and hangover cures and shit like that. I can't keep up with this routine. Um, Zoro Pabob is hashtag daily nexus the joke that just keeps on giving. Can I uh, I'm going to go American and plead the fifth. <laughs> I'm going straight past. Scroll past. Uh, at Guna underscore love, how much do you rate Sari? Sari versus Emery, Tone? Um, it's, it's a weird one because Sari's got this reputation as a continental genius. Uh, he's coming in from Napoli where he's done a, a, a good job, but he's seen as a, a high-class appointment. Uh, they're bringing in a, a genius. And Emery was seen as... We couldn't get our first 10 choices, so we got our 11th. That, that's how the, the image was perceived. But who's managed bigger clubs? Emery. Who's won more trophies? Emery. Who's handled bigger players? Emery. Who's done stuff more recently in terms of who's won, who won trophies the season just finished? Emery. So it's just a really weird narrative that's going around that Sarri's this, this absolute genius when... In reality, I don't think he's ever won anything. I remember reading before that... Um, yeah, he came up from the Serie, Serie B. He yeah, but I think they came there, second. This is what I was just about to oh, say. I remember okay. reading before that even when he got promoted, he didn't win the league. I might be wrong on that, but I did read it somewhere. So it's a weird one. When you look at... Even if he did win it, which I'm not sure he did, but let, let's say he did, 
So you're comparing all of Emery's uh, achievements, three Europa Leagues, the, the French League, the French Cup numerous times versus a Serie B title. If I was just to put their CVs on paper and say one's being held a genius and one's being held as uh, we couldn't really get who we wanted, so we got this one. You know what I mean? If you took yeah, the names off the CVs, right. yeah. you know what way you'd pick. Yeah, uh, and I was just about that. I was, yeah, I think this season. Oh, he did because there's a big shit fight with Sarri. Um, I, I I can't remember what it is, boys. Memory's gone, but I think it was halfway through last season. Napoli were actually in front of Juventus, and they actually looked like. You know, obviously, op- opting the, the, the fans are going, oh, yeah, we're going to win the league type thing. But Sarri sacrificed the league. Now, I don't know whether he knew that they weren't going to win the league, and they sacrificed the league for – it's a trophy. It's equivalent to the FA Cup type thing. And I think they won it by memory. I just – because the fans were blowing up about it. So he won that little trophy. Um I can't even think what it's called now. Poker Italia. Yeah, so he won that, but he sacrificed the league for it, and he did come under a bit of bloody bit of shit fight by fans as well for that, because at the time they were in front of Juventus. So I wonder whether you're going to see a, a Sarri sacrifice the league for a FA Cup or a bloody what's that energy drink cup? Carabao, but they they, uh, they didn't win it anyway. Juventus won it. Oh, they didn't win it either. Juventus won it, did they? There you go. Uh, yeah. Fuck, I'm sure Napoli won it. Okay. Oh, I'll double check that. Um, but I'll so take, I'll take your word. Oh, I'm wrong. Okay, I'll take your word for it. It was, it was some trophy I thought he won this year. It's, anyway. I don't know. Wasn't I don't know. that? I can't think. Might have been that. Okay. Um, Zorro par Bob. I have a feeling that Emery will not sign another centre back. Uh, but wait and see how the current C- CB squad performs up till January. Mustafi being the player most under pressure to perform, otherwise being sold. Do you agree, Schwinn? I agree. And actually, this brings us to uh, an interesting question that I wanted to throw to you guys, which is, who do you think, from the current, let's assume that this is our the end of our transfer activity, Right. Uh, and Mustafi stays, and there's no other defenders that, that we bring in. Uh, who do you guys think will be our starting centre-back pairing um, for the, let's say, for the first uh, month? Uh, or let's say for the first three, four months at the time Koscielny is available? Um, it's funny because the Clay co-conservative, the one who just picked you up at the, uh, the start of the questions, has been DMing me quite a bit the last couple of days. And uh, we had this discussion yesterday. I think there's so little between pretty much all of our centre-backs. I think Socrates will start just because of the new signing. And then I literally would find it very difficult to pick. If, if someone said to me now, you have to choose one who you think he will use, Emery will use, it would be between Chambers and Mustafi, and I would probably go for Chambers. Um, but, I, I mean, I wouldn't be confident in that prediction at all. Yeah, I've got nothing. Oh, mate, uh, probably Chambers, Mustafi. I think, I think you've got to start, like, he'll start Mustafi. See, that's my, that's my thing. I've, I've, from, from what I've seen of Mustafi and, of course, of Calum Chambers, I, I don't think they're, they're very well suited to the, to the left center back role because it's not about just playing two center backs, right? You usually have one aggressor and then you have one who sits back and, and does the mopping up. Uh, if the aggressor does indeed fail uh, in recouping the ball. And from from what I've seen of our defenders, I think the choice would be between Holding and Mavropanos because Socrates, in my view, uh, will start at right center back. And for me, it's then between Mavropanos and Holding. And I just think that Mavropanos might just take it, take the starting spot. I know he's young. I know he's just come in and he's been hyped. Uh, of course, listeners will load, know that me and Tony were, were very easy on him, and we you know we didn't really uh, run with uh, the Marupanos hype. But I really do think that it's not between Mustafi and Holding, and but between Marupanos and sorry Mustafi and Chambers, but between uh, Holding and Marupanos. I think he'll go he'll go Mustafi because of Mustafi's been there and done it. Um, 
But that's what I'm saying. Mm. He's not done it at the left center oh. back position. Yeah. He's he's usually the mm, one who's God. doing the biting while Koscielny sits back. Yeah, I think they're too similar. Uh, this is exact, literally what you just said is pretty much the conversation I had with, uh, as I said, Cloke Conservatives or whatever his name is in the DMs. That I think Mustafi and so- uh, Socrates are, are so similar that I, I, I literally cannot see it working, them two playing together. The only reason I'm still in a, a 50-50 that he may start is because we I don't think any of the options are standout. Um, and I think sometimes when there is no standout option, a lot of people in football, and obviously we don't know of Emery, but a lot of people in football tend to go with their most experience. And, and obviously there's no doubt that, that, that Mustafa here is the most experienced of the options. Hmm. Okay. The sad day it is when Mustafi is <laughs> the more experienced option. Yeah, look, he's won the World Cup. <laughs> he, Sitting he's, on the he's bench, though. To be, yeah, but he's going to be the most... I, I agree with what Tony said, though. He's He'll start Mustafi. Even though we don't think it's right, that's like the question was, I suppose, who who do you think he's going to start? Do, do we I think don't know it's if right he will, and I probably wouldn't, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he does. As I said, when there's no clear candidate, uh, uh, a lot of people go for experience. Um, so, as I said, I wouldn't be entirely surprised. It wouldn't be my pick. How long you leave Mustafi there for, though? Who knows? He might think, oh, we'll start him. I don't know. Mustafi might well, come we'll, out and we'll have a blind. We'll, we'll find out a lot more in the next few weeks because we've got the, the few friendlies and even if we don't play our first team in friendlies, which we probably won't, we, we'll start to see pairings and, and how people link up. Mm. Uh, that's what, in a way, kind of goes what we Schwinn said and I was going to say at the time that I know it was only Boreham Wood, but he paired Mustafi and Holden uh, at centre-back and he paired Socrates and, and Mavropanos. Maybe it was just a Greek thing, I don't know, but if that continues during pre-season with them pairings, then I would probably suggest it will be my mm-hmm. Okay, RC or Zoro Pabob also asked, Tony, how often do players actually get paid at Arsenal? While salaries are reported on uh, as per week basis, I'm sure they don't actually get paid weekly and it's the same for bonuses? Uh, yeah, the vast majority get paid um, monthly with, with bonuses included. Obviously, there's some bonuses that are, that are season long. Um, so then they'll get paid at the end of the season. Or if they've got a bonus, once you hit 15 goals, for example, that'll get paid when you hit the 15 goals or 15 assists or 15 clean sheets, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But, but the basic wage is paid monthly, the same as pretty much everyone else in the UK that's, uh, that's employed. But, uh, yeah, football, I I don't know why football, obviously, worldwide is broke down into a per-week figure. I don't know if that's just the figures would be so ridiculous if you name them monthly that they feel that they have to break down weekly. But even in the lower leagues, even if, like, uh, you speak to players that are semi-professional and they'll go, oh, yeah, I'm on £50 a week or £50 a game. Like, just, obviously, it's not their income. It's just what they do for a bit of fun. But football football is always broke down into per-week. And I think it probably was originally broke down into per-game, but then that left things messy during the summer when people aren't playing um, that's obviously a big issue with appearance fees I know a lot of players don't like uh, obviously the one of the rumoured issues with Jack is he didn't want a large part of his wages to be paid in the appearance fees not because he was scared of not playing but because you can earn big amounts during the season and then earn next to nothing in three months of the summer or, or, or eight weeks of the summer um, even, that, even if you're on an appearance fee or a per game fee it would still be paid at the end of the month to answer the question but, um, yeah, it's just how it's broken down to tell the public. I'm not sure why that is. Did you say everybody else in the UK, so like Tom the Butcher, fucking Benny the Baker, are they getting all paid monthly? Yeah, vast majority of UK's monthly. Fucking, I'm always a miserable cunt. Fair think by the fourth week, you cunts be broke. Yeah, but the first weekend's a good one. Oh, the first weekend's a ripper. <laughs> 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 okay, um... Okay, sorry about that. Um, Shri uh, Schwinn. Shri and Schwinn. Fucking tongue twister, that is. Uh, do you guys think Emery, Emery's imperfect English will be exploited against him by the opposition managers and the media? Something similar happened uh, to, to Wenger during the wife comment with Saf. Bear in mind... Uh, Wenger had a much better gas 
grasp of English in comparison to Emery? I'm not sure if I get the premise of the question, if I'm honest. I think, if anything, Emery's imperfect, quote-unquote, imperfect English and his proclivity to use it has surprised the media. Uh, I don't think any manager is going to stoop to the level of you know, criticizing his English or, or taking shots at him because of his English. And yeah, the media might, you know, um, twist some of the words and the expressions, but, you know, those are very easy to, to decipher. If, if, if you watch a video or, or something, you can easily tell that that was not the intention of it. Um, I think uh, a, perhaps a, a bigger uh, issue can be what happens on the training ground. I mean, of course, we have a lot of Spanish speakers in our team. So, so we have that taken care of, and I'm sure there's people who can do all the translation and stuff, but you know, when you're on the field and there's a game going on, then not all instructions can be, can be taken in, uh, with the luxury of time. And, you know, I'm, I'm more interested to see how that goes on with, with people barking instructions, how, how our players are able to absorb those instructions in game with this, you know, slight language barrier. Uh, but outside the football outside the pitch, I'm not too worried about his English. I think he's shown tremendous uh, courage, and I've sh- I think he's shown tremendous uh, will to to stick with English since day one. Uh, anyone who speaks more than one language will will know that it's never easy to converse uh, in, in in a second or or, or a third tongue. And uh, I think for that, he's all, almost been appreciated not just by Arsenal fans but by the media as well. So. Uh, maybe Shri and I can follow up and we can discuss what he really meant. But for me, he's he's shown real class and real courage so far. Yeah, I can. I'm not bothered, I, I can just butt in. I can just butt in there. I think he meant. I don't know if you remember, but uh, early on in in Wenger's reign, they, someone asked him a question uh, about something Ferguson said. Like, for example, it wasn't this, but Ferguson said, "Oh, we're a better team than Arsenal." And Wenger said, "Everyone's uh, thinks they've got the best wife at home," and. Alex Ferguson took offence to it. He didn't take offence to it, but it was the way his mind games worked. Um, I doubt he really found it offensive. Um, no, I, I, I think my, my answer to the question... Yeah, I mean, my answer to the question would be England in the 96 when Wenger came, we didn't have any foreigners in football, very, very few. Uh, so as a nation, or especially in terms of football, but probably as a nation as a whole, we are a lot more xenophobic. Um, so... Like if you took the piss out of someone's accent, it wasn't considered wrong. It was just normal. It's what you've done. You couldn't speak properly. Whereas the world, thankfully, and England have evolved a hell of a lot more since then. Um, so I, I can't see it being an issue. But I, I know where the question's coming from, from Shri. Okay. Uh, Shri also asks, what did you guys make of Emery's five captains explanation during his press conference a week ago, Tony? Um, I think he said it as well when he first when he first signed and they asked him for me it just screams out we don't have a leader it screams out oh we don't have one so he says oh and, and you you hear it all the time I want captains all over the pitch I don't want one and that just pretty much as I said everyone it's look, you can say the Invincibles had leaders all over the pitch in Omri in Campbell in, and then in Ashley Colby a lot of reports was, was very strong and vocal on the pitch but everyone knew who the main man was in Vieira and I think what Emery's getting at is I need leaders everywhere. I need everyone to be in charge and in control. But when, when managers release statements like that, and it's not an in Emery thing, I always think it of other clubs. For me, it just screams like I don't know who, who our real leader is. You never heard Chelsea when John Terry was captain say, oh, yeah, but, but Drogba's a leader, Lampard's a leader. They probably were, but Terry was the man. Mm. And, and you, could go to, you could look at a load of clubs, but obviously that's, Terry's a good example and Vieira's a good example at Arsenal. So, yeah, for me, it just shouts I don't actually know who's, who's going to be the, the on-the-pitch leader. OK. MAA Gunner says, Schwinn, if we won the Premier League this season and every player was to retire, which players do you think would be called legends? For example, Ramsey. Wow. Um, <laughs> I think that'd be it, maybe. Um, <laughs> Kuchelny maybe uh, I, I'd say Kuchelny definitely if if you're selecting Ramsey as a legend uh, which I think uh, I mean both of them have you know been there when we won certain trophies in, in, in our in our recent past and yes they are not Premier League trophies but let's not forget that you know we were coming uh, we had just come across a, a rough patch and you know the, the financial restraints had just been sort of lifted and at that point you need 
almost real leaders going off of the last question to to see things through. You know, one of our biggest complaints against Liverpool, Tottenham, Sarri uh, ha- have been that they don't win stuff. They, they bottle it. And, you know, just to counter that, I think players like Koscielny, Ramsey, of course, who scored crucial goals, uh, just for that, coming over the coming over the hilt and coming over this adversity that that affected our club for almost ten years, um, I'd probably call both of them legends. But other than that, I'm struggling to to think of anyone. I'd have to uh, say Bama, I'd have to say Bama Yang, who finished his career at Arsenal. <laughs> the ten goals in half a season. No, no, no. But he's saying if we won the Premier League this season. So if we won the Premier League this season. Aubameyang is mm. going to, you know, be crucial to that, isn't he? It all, for, for me, this all comes down to circumstance. If we win the league, and and Lacazette, who scores fifty goals, uh, then then you say him. It all, or if someone has an Aguero moment, even if they don't have the greatest year, but if we win the league with the last kick of the game, and uh, to pick out anyone, anyone's had an awful year but they get that last-minute flick on and, and it goes in the back of the net. Like Danny Welbeck against Leicester. Had we won the league that year, Danny Welbeck could be an Arsenal legend because it was that moment. And obviously, an Aguero is a great player, but he didn't have to be. He will always be remembered as a City legend for that moment. Mm. So I think circumstance plays a part more than anything else. Mm-hmm. OK, um, MWA going to continue. W- just yep, just sorry, quickly, Gershwin. I would also like to uh, like to say that whatever MWA Gunner has been smoking, I'd, I'd like some of that because that's a wild question. <laughs> yeah, they don't cross anything that. like that. <laughs> uh, do you want me to send you some over? <laughs> <laughs> OK, MWA Gunner. Uh, which top six side do you think has done the best business this summer? Go, with Tony first. Um, look, on, on paper, um, especially if you just relate good business with transfer fees spent, everyone's going to be looking at Liverpool. I think we've probably plugged more gaps. Um, obviously, we needed a keeper, we needed a right back, um, we needed a centre back, and we needed a holding midfielder, and we've got all four of them the quality of them or the, the names don't shout as loud as the Liverpool names do but I think I feel we've plugged our needs and Liverpool have actually plugged their needs they've just spent a lot doing it so I think it would be between us two um, I'm, look, I've seen other teams spend not not so much like, like Man City they've spent 70 million on Mahrez or whatever it was who I think is an amazing player but they didn't need him so I, for me that doesn't go down as a great mm. transfer because it didn't fill the that, need that, that they had it was an odd one actually yeah, I think it was just they chased him so long and they were showing that they could eventually get whatever they wanted. But yeah, okay. for me, a good transfer window, you you fix what's broken, in a sense. And we needed a second choice right back. We fixed that. We've needed a keeper. We've got one. Whether we fixed our problems, we don't know. You could say the same about Socrates. We needed a centre back. Whether we fixed the problems, we don't know. With mm. Torreira, we needed a DM. And it looks like we fixed the need, but we'll never know until the season starts. And you could say the same with Liverpool. They needed a keeper and they've got one they needed a second choice right winger and they've got one have they fixed their needs we don't know but at least they've tried so I would say it's out of us two because the signings we've made are actually what we need Schwinn I'll have to agree and I'll I'll take a leaf out of Tony's book here and, and use the word value you know that's something Tony has spoken about a lot and that's basically in a nutshell what he just spoke about right now uh, you know, you can always spend 200, 300 million and, you know, that that will never be considered the best business. Best business means getting the most amount of value for your money. And uh, I think the Torreira signing in particular shouts that uh, I still have my reservations about Socrates. And of course, we haven't seen much of Torreira yet, but even someone like Licksteiner, you know, you, you can never argue with a free signing that's going to come and bring some experience and, and, and some leadership in the locker room, something we dearly miss. Uh, so, so for me, uh, I think we've done some very, very good business. Of course, the Aaron Ramsey and, and Danny Welbeck issue aside, um, I think we are probably in a shout for for probably having one of our best summers in recent memory. I'm going to just say quickly, I think the best business done so far is Shakiri at Liverpool. For 13 million. I forgot about that. I think that is just a steal. For the price I got him at, and how we didn't, how Arsenal did not go for him for thirteen million, I think that may come back to bite us. 
I'm actually glad we didn't sign him. Um, tell me more, Tess. Tell me why that bothers you, or unless you were being sarcastic. No, 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 I'm not. I, I, mate, I, I, I've always liked him. I've always liked what he does. Um, he gets there and he, 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 you know, he finds the gaps. He bugs defenders. He's, he's a pain in the fucking ass. Um, and I think it's a type of player Arsenal could have had, and especially for 13 million. You, you tell me well, an, another 13 million dollar player who, who is as good as him. Again, I think you can take price out of it. For me, I just see a player that has weight issues that's only going to be playing once a month, and that ain't going to help weight issues. So, uh, for me, I, look, I rate Shakiri, um, but he he's there to plug a gap as a, as a second choice to Salah, and they've got a good player doing that. But how much he remains a good player when he is sitting on the bench every week and, and barely getting a look in remains to be seen. Look what happened to him at Bayern Munich. He went there with the world at his feet, and he left for Stoke. That for me, he went on loan to Inter because yeah, 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 yeah. he couldn't cut it there. So I, I think you've got to look at what uh, suits the player as well. In terms of yeah, getting the player for 13 million, you can't argue. But but again, the circumstances, I, I think he's probably not the ideal player to have sitting around as a squad player. No, I, I don't. I think he's. I, I agree with what you're saying. He's. If he was at Arsenal, though, would he be a starter? Or you think no. he'd be a squad player? No, I don't think he's good enough to be a starter at any team that has aspirations of winning anything. Mm, okay. And that's shown throughout his career for me. Apart, look, I mean, Basel had aspirations of winning the Swiss League, and as far as I know, they pretty much do it every year. But from then on, he went to Bayern, wasn't a starter. Inter wasn't a starter. Didn't They didn't want to sign him after a loan. Went to Stoke, started, didn't really do much, done okay. Won't start at Liverpool. I think... Shakiri's a nice player, but if you have aspirations of winning anything, and I think Switzerland kind of suits him because he's their, their key man, their star man, but they've never got aspirations of winning anything. They get ranked highly every year. They're in the top six in the world or top ten in the world. Never got close to winning anything ever and probably never will. Uh, you can't blame him for that, but I think that's the type of player he is. He looks good in a nearly team, and Liverpool don't want to be a nearly team. Mm, mm, I, I think he, I don't know. We'll see how he goes this year, but I, I just, for me, I'll look. I, I disagree with everything you said there. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, you haven't sold me yet. <laughs> I, I will say this though, Tez. Show me another player who's who's costed thirty million and makes the wage he does. So, you know, he, he's probably on a very high wage compared to his peers in the, in that financial category. Uh, you know, Stoke probably had to liquidate since they've been re- they've been relegated and. Again, to Tony's point about aspirations, he's going to be playing second fiddle to Salah, who's probably going to be in the team sheet whenever available. So uh, the attitude doesn't sound right. And yes, 30 million is, is, is a steal, but he's probably making, what, 80 grand, 100 grand, I would imagine, at the very least at Liverpool. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's quite a waste, isn't it, for just to have someone sit on the bench? And I don't think you'll sit on I don't think you'll sit it. Look, it... it I don't think you'll sit on the bench as much as you think. Well, you can only play one position, and their best player can only play one position, and it happens to be the same position. Salah's not going to go and play as a nine. No, but... Shakiri's not going to go and play on the left, so he can play on the right wing, which is where Salah plays. That's it. Mm. For, for me, it's going to be the last five, ten minutes of the game, because uh, what we know for, of Liverpool is that Roberto Firmino is crucial to, to their game style and Klopp likes to take him off at the 80th, 85th minute if things are going well because he's the first line of defense. Uh, he likes to preserve him uh, if, if the game is going well. And we've usually seen it the, uh, during the last season, Salah take up that nine position um, and then have someone on the right wing. And that's when I see Shakiri come on. But for that, is he really worth it to be paying him that much amount of money? I mean, Liverpool have shown that money is not a problem for them. But for us, and that's obviously how we got here, for us, it obviously is an issue. And I'd rather see an Alex Iwobi come on in the 80th, 85th minute, who's an academy product, uh, than a 13 million pound player who's making 100 grand a week. But also, that's just me. Yeah, also as well, Liverpool's game's built on high pressing, as is ours going to be apparently according to Emery's statement. And Shakiri is not a player for the high press. So I, uh, I, I don't think... I completely disagree with everything Tess has said, and he disagrees with everything I said. So it's just one then we're going to swing around in roundabouts. <laughs> yeah, no, all good. Um, okay, M A Gunner. If Giroud was willing, 
willing to sit on the bench and only play when needed, would you resign him, Schwinn? Look, I love Oli. I'm very, very happy for him that he's gone on and won the World Cup, uh, despite his criticisms, despite you know criticisms in the aftermath as well that he scored zero goals, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm very, very happy for him. But I think we closed a chapter with him, and I would probably... I mean, I'd, I'd have him back, but it's not something I would actively pursue. If it fell into our laps, it was a good deal. Uh, financially, of course, I'd, I'd welcome him back. But, you know, in terms of the football, I don't think we need him, uh, with all due respect to him. And, uh, again, you know, he's, he's probably going to want a certain wage. Uh, that's not something we'd probably want to, you know, want to indulge at this moment. So uh, love him to pieces, but, you know, I'm, I've come to terms with him gone, and I'd like to not do that again. You're going to Chelsea, you're done. Done. Tony, I'd take him back uh, just just as an option. It gives us something different. Um, even I know, I know, obviously, I know Aubameyang couldn't play, but even against Atletico Madrid in both legs, we were screaming out for someone that could header the ball and we could just get it wide and put it in. And our one goal in the tie came from a Lacazette header, and he's five foot seven. Giroud's seven inches taller or eight inches, to- uh, no, nine inches taller. So. I think I would take him back as an option. Um, I spoke about Danny Welbeck being there because he does something our other players can't. And I think Giroud's the same. If he, if, look, if he agreed, he'd be third-choice striker. Um, and there's, But the other two are going to be starting, whether they're starting up front or not, in, in Lacazette and Aubameyang, which is what it looks like. I, I think he would know what role he's taken up and if he's happy to play that role. Um, I, look, I'm not saying I'd actively go after him, but if, if as Srin said, if the opportunity arose, which... By report, Sarri doesn't want him. It looks like it could arise. I would have no issue of bringing him back. On the flip side, um, he said he would shave his head if they won the World Cup. He's not quite shaving it, but he has had a haircut and he looks very weird. <laughs> I don't and, know if you've seen it. But no, Google I haven't it, seen but. it. I'll have to have a look at it. I haven't seen it. Um, yeah, I just, I just can't. I'm just thinking what you're saying there. I, what, what, you're going to pay him 80. What, 80? What are you going to pay? Uh, him, yeah, 60? he was on around that. You didn't want to pay Shakiri to sit on the bench, but you want to pay Drew to sit on the bench. He gives us something that uh, they don't. He gives us something we don't have. Mm. We don't have it. Oh, I know we something. don't have it. Yeah, yeah. But geez, that'd be bloody what four strikers sitting on the bench. Well, look, I mean, no disrespect to Welbeck or Perez, but he goes above them instantly, and it looks like Aubameyang and, and um, Lacazette are both going to start. So he actually comes in as your, he comes your in next option. Three. Yeah. And Welbeck looks yeah, like but, going out. Yeah, but I mean, even if Welbeck mm. was there, in terms of as a striker, look, Welbeck can play on the wing, Giroud can't. But as a, as a nine, then you'd arguably have him as second choice because it looks like Aubameyang's going to start on the left and Lacazette's going to start through the middle. So then your change of option would either be to bring Welbeck or whoever on on the left and, and put Aubameyang through the middle or to bring Giroud on. If, uh, if yeah, no, there. okay, but, I mean, yeah, you've won me around. I'd, I'd have him back then. No, I'd, yeah, because especially in the Europa League games, I'd rather start yeah. him than a, a Giroud than a bloody, um, you know, Welbeck or a or a Perez. Well, we really haven't had so much of Perez, really, have we? So we'd have more uh, trust mean, but, in Giroud. Uh, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's something that's, uh, that's going to happen or, or feasible, but I, I personally would do it. I've seen a lot of people on, on Twitter this week being both pro and con this, uh, but I, I'm definitely much in, uh, in the camp that would do it if, if available. Yeah, no, you've swung my around. I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, MAA Gunner, why are the Ozil haters so quick to forget the achievements Ozil has reached? Uh, Tony? Um, look, I think when you're criticising someone or if you, you want to criticise someone for some reason, you, you take the view that you that you want to take uh, just to, to provide a parallel. Like, uh, it's completely different. But if if you want to praise Harry Kane for the World Cup, you say he was a top scorer. If you don't want to praise him, you say he didn't actually play very well and he scored three penalties. I, I think when you're criticising, it's very easy to, to take the negatives and ignore the positives. And, and that's pretty much what's happening with Ozil. Okay, I'll stick with Tony on this one, Schwinn. Um, hack on Larson, he's got a couple of questions. So Willen on his way to Barca, merry-go-round incoming. I'm, I'm not just 
think about all the Dembele crap, but Chelsea need a replacement and Willen out. My force has it to stay. Can't lose them both. Would be very bad business if that's the case. Well, yes, but uh, I think Williams. I mean, sorry, I think Hazard's only got a year left. So, and by all accounts, he has no interest in signing, pretty much judging by his own interview. So, they they may be forced to get rid of both. And I, there's also a part of me that, that, as good as he is, and I'm a huge Eden Hazard fan, I'm a big William fan as well, but I don't actually think either of them particularly suit Sarri. So, I wouldn't be surprised because he's more, he's very quick, very fast flowing football, which both of them players are, but they're more get the ball down and dribble at someone. Whereas, especially Sarri's Napoli team, which is the only time I've really seen him, if I'm honest, mm. but they're more pass and move. Um, and you think of all the players they've got, um, like obviously Mertens, Callahan, um, Insigne, Insigne is maybe a bit different, but they're not the players that get that go and dribble at players, they're, they're pass and move. And I'm not sure if William and Hazard suit that. So I wouldn't be surprised to sell them both. And if it, as it looks like, William is the one that goes through first, I think Hazard's got them bent over a bit if he has only got a year left, unless I've been misinformed on that. But I am pretty sure he's only got a year left. So they're either going to have to take the rumoured 100 million now or round about 100 million or lose him for nothing next summer. Yeah, it's a hard one. We were in that situation not so long ago. Sure were. Um, Hack on Larson also says, and this can be for Schwinn, if Rambo doesn't sign and we keep him, will Emery freeze him out of the squad and doesn't let him play and force him or force him to sign in a way? I don't think freezing him out of the squad will force him to sign. You know, he'll be more than happy to to sit out, uh, collect his paycheck uh, every week or every month, and look for options. Um, for for a new club, starting the time when you know he's told that he's not going to be playing, uh, I don't even think that's going to be a criteria for the manager. You know, as, as a manager who is not in charge of the contracts, which Emery has made very clear, and we of course know from backroom additions, he's going to concentrate on winning the games. He has to concentrate on saving his job and making sure that the fan base knows that he's the right person for the job. If that means playing an Aaron Ramsey at the beginning of the season, who still hasn't signed a contract, he will play Aaron Ramsey. Or at least that's what I would hope he would do. Well, it's not uh, it's not his decision were... for signings, is it, really? Like, he's there to manage the squad um, and get the squad winning games. He doesn't really, you know, obviously he'd like Ramsey to sign and he'll say publicly, I'll, I want Ramsey to sign. But at the end of the day, it's not him negotiating it. So it's not really his job, as you say. That, that's exactly right. And, you know, I mean, as I said, it would be stupid for him to freeze him out. If, if Unless he doesn't want him, which we know is not the case, he said publicly that he wants him to stay and he sees Aaron as uh, as a big part of his team. Uh, so keeping that in mind, if if Aaron is to not extend it and you know look for different clubs, I, I would still play him because if, if, if the manager believes he's crucial to, to the setup, then it, it makes sense to use that asset while we still have him. Uh, you know, you still want to, of course, start preparing for what to do once he's gone. But that's that's for that's to worry in the future for. You know, that's not what you want to think about right now. Um, so I don't think freezing him out uh, really helps us in any way. He's an extra man. He's he's a very good player. We've seen that before, and and he can be used in a variety of uh, different ways. So uh, forcing him out, uh, sorry, uh, freezing him out, I don't think will achieve any good. No, I agree. Emery's going to play the best best. Team he can put on the pitch. Um, Hack and Larson also says, "Did all the Arsenal ITKs die?" And for those one on ITK in the no die, not many transfer rumours right now. However, I've got one for you, Hack and Larson. Right now, hot off the press at Clock and Talk, I have a funny feeling Benzema is coming to Arsenal. Heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got our at wrong there. No, that's always helpful. Oh, did I get that wrong? Did I? <laughs> um, anything it always on helps when you're talking nonsense. <laughs> Any on them? Anything on that, Tony? They're all uh, dead. Well, it's either a case of they've all lost all sources or whatnot, which is obviously entirely possible with the changes we've been through. Or the other option, which people don't want to believe, is that nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. That's right. Okay. Um, soon. Fuck me. At SDMN underscore one one two dot thirteen hours ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
Thoughts on Ozil and his retirement from international football and how we've, mate, we've gone through all that. I don't think we can really get much more, can we? No. No, okay. Um, Kosamin Buta. Since Tuore is coming in late, do you think he will be part of our first big games, Tony? Um, yes, because I believe he's only taking a two-week break, which, oh no, that would be up, so he's taking a, a three-week break. Tight, very tight, but he should be fit because he's not taking a long break. It's not like a normal pre-season where they've had six, seven weeks off and they come back a bit overweight. And when I say overweight, they're not like, they're, they're not at playing weight. They're not fat by any sense of the, the word. <laughs> Cut on fat. Did not you, their optimal playing you're weight. You're talking about weight. Did you see a Bemi? I've seen a photo of a Bemi, yeah. And I thought, did he get skinnier again? Well, everyone that's been anywhere near the club said, and I, I said it about the game at Boreham Wood, I said, I'm not going to take anything from it apart from he looked very sharp and like he hadn't had any time off. He looked in yeah. shape. Yeah. Uh, uh, he looks like he's not had a, uh, any break at all. I, I don't know what he's been doing. But um, I mean that in a good sense, not that he looks knackered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, with, with Torreira, obviously, uh, he's had a long long season at a World Cup and then, uh, by all accounts, a short break. I don't know if he's going to meet up with them in Singapore. Whether He might not play. He, he almost certainly won't play. But he was due to return on Monday... I know we're playing in Singapore Thursday and Saturday. I don't know if we then leave Singapore straight away and go to, we've got two friendlies in Europe, one in Dublin and one in Stockholm, I think. Uh, if he's involved in, the, the last one is Lats, is it Lazio? Um, it's just been changed. Whoever is meant to play pulled out and now we've got someone else. Okay. Um, but that's on a, the week before the season starts. We'll see if he's involved in that because he shouldn't be, as I said, he shouldn't need to do the fitness stuff at the start because he'll be very close to fitness anyway. Okay. Uh, Vish, he was he's um, was on the podcast earlier asking questions. So, uh, with West Ham and Everton bringing in Pellegrini and Silva, coupled with their signings, do you think Arsenal's position in the top six is in jeopardy? I know, I know, we're aiming for the title or the top four minimum, but Liverpool's transfer business, along with United and Chelsea, don't don't go well. Schwinn? I think the the top six is a very very hard ceiling to to break into. Uh, you know, of course, Marcus Silva and Pellegrini are are accomplished managers, and we've seen some elaborate transfer activity in in both those clubs, but you know. Breaking into the top six is is sort of like winning for uh, the rest of the clubs, and uh, that's a habit. You know that, that that it doesn't come just once, unless of course someone from the top six has a has a really bad season, and of course then one position opens up. Uh, if that's the case, and of course then it could be one of these two teams, but I don't see that to be the case. I think the top six will be competing uh, to stay in the top six and you know try and get the top four. And and by that by that benchmark, I, I think I think it's going to be still at least one or two years away for for a club like West Ham and Everton under this uh, managerial role for Pellegrini and Silva before they can, yeah, you know, right they can on, challenge okay. up there. We, we got you, we got you, we got you. <laughs> let's let's wrap this up, boys. I, I, and only reason I wrapped you up quickly there, Shwin. I think we answered pretty much most of that question when he rang through because it was a very similar question. At the top six. Um, Liam Greyhurst, uh, reaction to Ozil's retirement from the national term. We touched on that. Brad's asked, do you guys think that Ozil dropped to a deeper midfield role similar to what Santi did, he would get less criticism? It seems that because he is, he's a 10, uh, he is a 10, people expect him to score or assist every other game. If he doesn't, they say he goes missing. Tony? Yeah, I, I was been thinking about this before. I'm not sure if I mentioned it on the pod, but I wouldn't be surprised if against lesser lesser teams at home, we go, if we do play a flat three, we go with one defensive or holding midfielder like a Xhaka or probably a Torreira and then go with Ozil and Ramsey to, to create that extra man and he can, he can play like a, a 
fall to 10, I guess, to make up a position. Um, the, the only, the, if, if he comes to play there all the time, and it, it does go hand in hand with the criticism he gets, he would obviously let, get less goals and less assists, which is to be expected if you're playing deeper. For me, that I think the criticism would probably worsen because they'd go, oh, well, if he's not getting goals or assists, what does he do? And I know it's the same criticism he gets anyway, but it was, obviously his numbers would be less if he played deeper. So while I think he could play there, and I think he could be very good there, and he has played there a lot for Germany, um, he played more of an eight for Germany a lot of time, most of the time, really. But I think it'd probably bring more criticism, not less. But I do think it's something Arsenal will do throughout the season. Yeah, OK. Um Hack on Larson Ashwin, uh, do you think our squad is underrated? Seems like everyone is slagging off us and wanks to all the money that Glock and City are spending. Our defence isn't the best, but but could do the job. Our midfielders could be could be fucking class. Our attack attacking option is fucking class. Absolutely agree, and I think we spoke uh, spoke about this in the pod earlier, so we can gloss over that for now. But I think we're all in agreement there. Uh, except for City, they only spent sixty million on Mares. They haven't spent much yet. <laughs> Not as uh, City's terms, anyway. Um, Hack on Larson. So many making fun or mocking Ozil because of the statement. It really shows how stupid, retarded, based, biased, and asshole some people are. Should he get more support by players, manager, etc. Regarding all this, Ozil is showing that he is a top-class player and a top-class man. Absolutely agree, Hack on. We did touch all over the Ozil stuff, mate. So, um, David asks, why is Ramsey's contract done? not done yet? Uh, David, we don't know, mate. Nobody knows. Tony, anything there? Because he's not signed it. Nothing happening. So it's on the table? Uh, I, I don't know. There, there, there has been soft offers, which means... They've put a proposal to him. They've not actually submitted the contract. But just when when players get offered a contract, the actual act of offering the contract is done after everything's already agreed. So they'll send a form, uh, a pretty much an informal email to his agent saying, we're going to offer you this term, this amount of money for this long with these incentives, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll negotiate from there and they'll get to a point where they've agreed and then the contract will be offered. That, that's pretty much how it works as long as you've got a good relationship with the club and the agent um, so as I said back in as we mentioned earlier I think it was December that there was an offer not on the table that they had formally said we will offer you this this and this and it was just ignored it was sitting in his agent's inbox and then the story started about his agency changing blah 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 which is all true but how, how much effect it has I don't know um I don't know if since then there's obviously been negotiations between the two and they are ironing out what that final contract should say or if it's still being ignored. I don't know. I just mm. know at the time, the initial when Arsenal tried to open conversations, there, there was nothing coming back from Ramsey's side. And I don't mean Aaron Ramsey himself, but his agents who obviously work on his behalf. OK. Heck on Larson asks, and I'll go to Schwinn, but I will come to you too, Tony. Uh, worst, first, but worst fan base on a general basis in the English Premier League. Liverpool and United for him. Uh, we are not far behind, though. Getting embarrassed by some of the stuff I see from our fan base, but Liverpool and United fans wink, wink over everything their club does and thinking fees is everything. Cunts. Swin? Um, it'll have to be Stoke or Chelsea for me. Uh, you know, Both are quite scum in their behaviour and... Uh, in some of their taunting, uh, Chelsea, of course, we've seen you know videos and instances of where they've been, they've travelled, and that obviously hasn't gone well. And uh, Stoke is just a miserable place to visit. I've been there a couple of times, and I don't know why I returned after my first time there. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Liverpool uh, and their fan base. I don't think it's you know the the atmosphere and everything seems to be a, a bit too overrated for my liking. Uh, you know, if if it was fun and it was good to good to be there, I'd I'd happily say that. Uh, but for me, Chelsea and Stoke are probably the lowest of the lows. Uh, Tony, yeah, uh, I I tend to ignore social media when we're talking about others' fan bases because if if people only went on, on social media, they'd think every Arsenal fan is either DT or Troops or or Robbie or someone like that or Claude. 
So I, I go on what I see when I'm there. So I don't even look at the fans that they bring to the Emirates, really, because I'm over the other side of the ground. So I don't judge them on that, even though an away support is a good way to judge a team. But I judge by the people I speak to when I'm in their city because that's when they feel most at home. And if they're going to be an idiot, they're going to do it there because they're surrounded by other idiots. And to be honest, the Liverpool fan base is pretty good. Um, the, look, the, the atmosphere is a myth. It's nowhere near as loud as everyone makes out. But as if they're, they're quite knowledgeable. They're, they're quite, if you say, they can admit if you're better than them or if someone you've got is better than someone you've got. They, you'll get Liverpool fans admit Ozil's a good player, which is quite rare when you go uh, elsewhere. Um, so Liverpool are, are quite good. United aren't bad. They've got a lot of plastic fans the same way we have at home. United away fans are very good. The United fans at home, uh, they're, they're going for their one trip a year or, or they're not particularly interested in football. It's just a, a day out for them. And, and the United fans moan about that a lot um, as well for, within their own fan base. Uh, the, the worst by far is Stoke. Um, not Look, they are all proper football fans because believe me, you wouldn't go to Stoke if you're not. But they just moan about everything. They are the most biased, bitter, angry people I've ever come across. But then if I lived in Stoke, I would be as well. So there is a reason for it. They live in Stoke. But <laughs> it, they are just a complete bunch of cretins. Like, honestly, it, it's the worst. There was There's a hilarious, and I, I think it was actually Schwinn that brought it to my attention, but I might be wrong. There was a hilarious story of a bloke who made a sub story. Um online and someone gave him their two spare tickets to a Stoke game and uh, he then filmed himself ripping them up and throwing them in the bin oh no he threw one of them in the bin uh, went to the other one and he took a shit on the toilet seat and left in the ground um, and that is exactly what they deserve okay um, I'm going to say probably well, obviously Spurs fucking can't say go on about everything all the time you know, if I, uh, yeah, and I've got to go on social media because I'm not up, up where you are, Tony, and I don't too. Oh, yeah, look, I understand. I'm, I'm yeah. going on what I see and everyone yeah. else has to go on what they see. Yeah, so I can only go on what I see. But, you know, like, they're the most deluded fucking cunts on social media. I fucking argue with them every fucking day. And I'm like, fuck me then. They, I don't think they've made one, they've not made one signing this window. And last window they made three late signings. Last summer it might have been. But, yeah, they're just so fucking deluded in their head, them cunts. Um, so Spurs, for me, Liverpool is up there. If I, hear, uh, if I hear about Liverpool's fucking history one more fucking time, I'm likely to shoot some cunt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fuck. <laughs> haven't won a trophy in fuck knows how long, and all they talk about is their fucking history. <sighs> anyway. Um, Red Fulcrum. Why does Schwinn's absent? Why does Schwinn absent in the few last few podcasts? Is that because all of his team didn't meet his expectations at the World Cup? Will he claim France to be his team? <laughs> to be honest, he was, he, was, he was detained at the Mexican border, but we we cannot. Because there is a lawsuit pending still, so we cannot go into detail about it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, serious question he's got. Um, if if Arsenal don't sign a proper winger, do you, uh, do you or are you satisfied with our transfer activity? Schwinn? Um, I'd be satisfied. Uh, I wouldn't be 100% satisfied. I wouldn't be, I mean, yeah. You know, before the summer started, and you know, we we did our our, our transfer pod, uh, looking out to what what we would like in the summer. I think uh, a winger was a commonality for all three. Someone in a goalkeeper, someone in a centre back, but a winger was something all three of us agreed on uh, being as a high priority, and um, that remains the case even now. I would say. So, yes, that will obviously be a shortcoming, but considering how we've strengthened. Otherwise, I think I, I still remain satisfied. Uh, more than the winger, honestly, I, I want a decision on Aaron Ramsey and Danny Welbeck. More so on Ramsey, because if if Welbeck is to leave on a free next summer, I wouldn't really bat an eyelid. But Aaron Ramsey right now is should be the focus of our, of our team that's working on all this stuff. And uh, a winger could be a luxury at this moment. It shouldn't have been 
in my opinion. But at this moment, I think it's become a luxury and Ramsey should be the focus of, you know, uh, of wrapping up our transfer activity. Tony, what about you, Mark? Uh, just in terms of transfer, I'm not going to go on to contracts and, and leave it on a free and whatnot. But I think we had five gaps. We've filled four of them so far. If we don't get a winger, that's a fifth one not filled. Um, so you can say in numbers, we've done 80% of the job. In terms of the names, we've done them jobs with, you may be a bit less satisfied. So look, I'm not going to be elated, but I'll, I'll be disappointed. I'd be somewhere in the, in between. Like, yeah, we've done okay sort of thing. Yeah, we've done quite good, but not enough to, to get excited about it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't hear what you're saying. Um, is there many wingers around? Because Walcott, and then we lost Chamberlain, so we haven't replaced that winger. And are we actually missing Walcott? Uh, for me, the type of player we need is someone that's going to commit men and run at them. Walcott was very good at running in behind. Uh, he was absent in a lot of play. Uh, a lot of people used to see that as a criticism, but for me, that was his style. He popped up at the end of attacks, but didn't get involved in them too often otherwise. I think that's not the type of player we need. We don't need someone to provide end product because... Aubameyang does that in abundance and, and hopefully Lacazette's shown in France he could do it and he showed in stages at the, at the back end of last season he could do it so hopefully we've got the end product we need someone that creates that space or, or gives the opportunity to, to, to have the end product uh, to put the plate on the table for them to, to eat off mm. so uh, I don't think we miss Walcott because although we need a right winger and he's a right winger it's, it's a very much a different style of player we need okay what was that glue was it uh, Gelson Martins Martins yeah he's he, what happened in there everyone was telling me he's for free just go and get him what mm. hasn't yeah. happened hasn't happened okay um, that's it for the questions so thank you for your questions um, and you know where we are at clock end underscore talk um, so you can hit us up anytime um, also I'll just touch quickly. So Craig, Savvy, and Carl, they're hammering away at the blog. There's plenty of writers coming in there, and you can find our blog, clockandtalk.blogspot.com. Um, and if you'd like to write for the blog as well, you're more than welcome. Just just hit us up on DM, and, um, yeah, you two can jump on board. Um, I meant to say, uh, I meant yeah. to say, sorry, Dad, because like, obviously, as you know, I have nothing to do with that, but... Um, their their Gwendausi piece got so many like retweets and likes. It must have had a lot of views. So well done to them on that. And if you haven't seen it, go and have a look because a lot of people seem to like it. Yeah, yeah, no, they're doing a good job, the boys. It's it's good stuff and lot. So we, I have a look. Yeah, not a, much of us do much on the blog us three, but um, them them boys are doing a good job. So it's 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 great to have the that little partnership with them lads as well. So um, is that about it, boys? You happy? Yeah. Yep. You going to join us next week, Schwinn? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should maybe try and do... Oh, wait. Next week's not the deadline day, is it? It's August 9th, right? Yeah, it's the 9th. So we're playing We're playing Thursday, Atletico Madrid, PSG on Saturday. I'm not sure about local times because it says in Australia where the time's about 1970 or something. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure about times, but we're playing on, uh, we're playing on, on, we're playing two games before we next pod. Um, much like football, I'll be coming home next week. So, um, I'm not sure <laughs> what day I'm available. <laughs> I'm actually surprised you're in Spain and you didn't end up in France to just to say you could take a fucking selfie for us and say, see, I told you it's coming home. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not Schwinn. I don't, I don't jump about nations depending on who's, who's doing okay this week. I, I'll be in France the next month, so I'll send you one from there, Tess. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, uh, boys. As always, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we better wrap this shit up, and we'll speak to you all next week. Adios. See you.